Welcome to Dust Jackets Conversation with Authors. My special guest today is E.J. Russell. She's an author of at least 37 published books, including five series that I could find to date. She writes across several genres, romantic comedy, historical, paranormal mystery, paranormal romantic comedy, and supernatural romantic suspense. At least that's for now. EJ describes herself as a mother of three and a recovering actor who writes romance in a rainbow of flavors. You can count on high snark, low angst, and happy endings. In terms of reality, not so much. She lives in rural Oregon, enjoys visits from her wonderful adult children, and indulges in good books, red wine, and the occasional hyperbole. Welcome, EJ. Hi, Maggie. It's great to be here with you. Thank you so much for making time for us. Um, I'd like to share with our listeners just a funny tidbit, a fun tidbit about you, because um, it turns out that we went to high school together <laughs> in Southern California 50 <clears throat> plus years ago. <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> um, and we were in drama club together. So, you know, we participated in plays as actors, some behind the scenes stuff. Uh, stage managers, anyone who's ever been in drama club in high school know that you tend to do everything. <laughs> you know, it's very few people that are only actors or only stage managers. Um, and then after graduation, we lost track of each other. And, you know, I think we went to college in different parts of the country. We chose different careers. We both moved around quite a bit. <laughs> and 40 years later, we meet at the Romance Writers Chapter in Portland, Oregon. What are the odds? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, it boggles my mind. And I have to give credit to you because you were the one who figured out who I was. I didn't recognize you or, re, or remember really that much about my, my uh, time. I, I, and I didn't notice right away. I think I probably had been a member of the chapter for at least two or three years because you were going by at least two different last names and not the one that I knew you by back in high school. And right. then I remember sitting in, in the meeting one time, it was when you were the treasurer, I think. Uh. I was looking at you and all of a sudden it went, bing, that's Maggie <laughs> McVeigh. <laughs> well, that's, that's just amazing. I um, am not very good visually in general. You know, I can remember people and lots of stuff about them, but like, I can't remember their names. So, <laughs> um, so but it, it was just really a fun coincidence. And um, I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone from high school outside of you uh, who became a romance writer. Do you? Not that I know of, but I'm very bad at keeping uh, in touch with people as you have <laughs> probably know, <laughs> given the fact it took us 40 years to reconnect. Right. Um, <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised simply because I think there are more romance writers out there in the world than, um, than, than people realize, just because it's such a broad genre and so many opportunities for people to tell wonderful stories. Exactly. Yes. Um, so, well, let's just kind of get into some questions about your writing. And so because we met in Drama Club, and um, I believe you continued to study theater, um, and maybe did some acting after high school. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about that and how that has affected your writing? You know, has it given you a process or a way that you approach your books that maybe people who don't have that experience um, might have? Well, um, af after high school, I went, I did study theater. I got a BA in uh, drama uh, with an emphasis in acting from UC Irvine. So I spent at least um, a year and a half in Wyoming before I finished up there. Um, I worked a bit at South Coast Rep as a, an acting apprentice and appeared oh. on stage there. Um, in fact, uh, because of some of the actors I appeared with there, if you count stage work as well as screen work, I'm like two steps away from Jack Nicholson. 
<laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> because one of the one of the people who um, was there at the time with me in the same sort of boat was Ari Gross, who appeared in a, a, a wonderful movie called Big Eden with Louise Fletcher. Oh yeah. And Louise Fletcher, of course, was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So, you know, there's I, sometimes it's fun to play that play that game. But uh, after I graduated from there, I moved to the East Coast. Um, worked in uh, as a, a secretary actually in the theater arts department at Emerson College before going to graduate school at Yale and I, in uh, theater administration. So I had a, have an MFA in theater admin. Um, after I graduated from there, I uh, went back to California and was the business manager at Berkeley Rep for oh my um, goodness several years before I started working for the company that provided our software and I sort of did a hard left turn into um, uh, computer work and ended up being a computer consultant for years. But uh, to answer your question, going back to what it was, if I can <laughs> get off my little train of thought caboose, um, one of the things that I discovered when I was first starting out as a writer is, and I don't know if this was true for you when you were starting out, but because you don't know what you don't know, you you try and learn as much as you can from other people. And every time you hear advice, you think that must be the way to do it. I have to be able to do that. You know, if, if I want to be a success, I have to, you know, have a um, a playlist for my, for every book, or I have to do, go and do all my writing in a coffee shop, or I have to do any other things. But um, now I'm, what, 11 years on in this, in this career. And so I've learned a lot about myself, one of which is I'm an auditory learner, which I think is why I recognized you. I recognized your voice oh my more goodness. than your face. Um, and so I have to write in silence. But as a result of that, I hear the characters talking in my head as if they were doing an improv, similar to the kinds of theater exercises we used to do um, back in the day. So that probably may be one of the the differences in, in my process than um, other people's might be who don't have a theater background is because all my first drafts are very dialogue heavy, lots of talking heads. And I have to go back and fill in, you know, where, where are they? Are they wearing any clothes? <laughs> What's the weather like? <laughs> I am so glad to hear that from you actually, because <laughs> I'm very much the same. I'm an auditory learner um, and but I think the difference is that mine are not dialogue heavy because I'm a very internal processor. And so um, when I start writing, my, my characters are doing too much thinking and not much talking. But they also do all of this in a white room in the middle of nowhere. So, <laughs> so I have to go back and, and add all those visual things. So I'm so glad because now I don't feel alone. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> also, I, I tend to be very reactive. So that's why I, li I like brainstorming with other writers, because something that someone will say will, will kick off something similar to an improv again. Um, in fact, I remember going all the way back to our high school days. I think when I was a sophomore, it was the year that we were in The Wonderful Adventures of Don Quixote together. Oh, yes. And at, the end, at the end of the year, um, one of the other um, students, Gary Muse, and I wrote um, a little, you know, end of year skit. And it was just, it was, that was probably the first thing I remember realizing that I was a reactive writer because we would bounce ideas off of one another and end up getting, you know, getting the, um, the script down that way. Wow. So. Oh, cool. Um, so do you ever, I, I know one of the things I do as a reformed actor is, <laughs> um, is that I have learned to act out my scenes in order for me to get some of those descriptive pieces, you know, like body language and, and things like that. Do you do any of that while you're writing? Well, if anyone were to watch me while I'm writing, because I fast draft, so mm. I just, you know, sort of blurt it out and then go back later and revise. But if anyone were to watch me, they would probably remark that I made a lot of very peculiar faces. Because as I'm writing in one character or another, I'm going, 
this is what he's, you know, how is he looking when he's saying this kind of thing? So <laughs> right. I do that to, you know, to a certain extent, even though That's I don't um, get up and, and run around the room and do it, but. <laughs> well, I, uh... I do get up and run around the room, but, <laughs> but um, that's usually in the editing phase, not in the fast dressing phase, when I realize again that I'm in a white room. So um, so uh, let me kind of uh, follow that up. So when we first reconnected, as I said, it was through romance writing. Um, but the difference was is that I was writing male-female romances and you were writing male-male romances. So did you inter publishing with the purpose of writing male male romances or um, did, how did that come about exactly and did you have a plan for that being your primary niche because it certainly seems that you're really well known in that arena well um <laughs> it's one of those things that my general obliviousness maybe had a lot to do with that because when I first joined um, Rose City Romance Writers where we met, the book that I was working on was in fact a male female romance. Oh. And when I was planning that series, which was set in a summer theater, um, <laughs> I expected that some of the books would be male female and some would be male male just because that's what my experience had been working mm. in theater. My best friend the last two years in high school was gay. Um, he came out to me in 1975 because of David Bowie, as a matter of fact. Oh, my gosh. Um, and my sons, I have two sons, they're both gay. Um, so it's just like, that's my world. And I thought that, you know, any romances would be, you know, a mix of those things. So I expected it to be pretty much a 50-50 split. Um, and then, so the first, but the first book that I had accepted for publication happened to be a male-male book. The second book with the same publisher was Male Female. Mm. That one remains my sole male female book that's published because the one after that was accepted by um, a, publishing, a publisher that uh, Riptide Publishing that is specializes in queer books. And so because that's what they were interested in, that's what I started to write. Mm. Um, and I found that I really enjoyed it because as, you probably have the same, a similar experience to some extent because we came of age at the same time, mm -hmm. right at the sort of at the, the dawning of the modern women's movement. Mm -hmm. I just, I get so irritated by sexual politics and gender dynamics. And if you're writing about two men, that at least levels the playing field. Um, oh, interesting. So there's, there's that part. And also because, because of Gordon, because of my sons, I want, I want gay romances to be mainstream. I want everyone to have a chance to have funny, happy, <laughs> snarky um, experiences without having to worry too much about um, oh, judgment, I guess. Oh, that's great. You know, I, I've heard of so many people that have gone into writing male-male romances for very similar reasons. You know, their, their children, um, relatives, their best friend, uh, things like that. And I, I, it's funny, you were probably a lot more aware than I was in high school <laughs> um, because I really didn't know, to my knowledge, I didn't know any gay people and I didn't really know much about the movement until well into the 80s um, when HIV AIDS became such a big deal and and I was living in Utah <laughs> so oh. um, <laughs> yeah so I, that that kind of was when my awareness became blown out but since then interestingly enough you know I have um, several cousins who are gender fluid I have one who has transitioned from male to female um, I have two gay cousins and so it's probably, it had probably always been like that. And I just was totally oblivious. <laughs> well, I was pretty oblivious then too. Like I say, Gordon didn't come out to me until 1975, two years after I graduated. Um, but also it wasn't, it wasn't that long after Stonewall. I mean, it was still not very uh, safe for people to be open. I had conversations with Gordon at one point. I said, you know, how, 
aren't you afraid of approaching people? I mean, how do you know? And he says, I always know. Oh, so, uh. <laughs> so apparently gaydar was a thing, which I did not have any clue about, <laughs> yeah. but, but uh, my friend did. So, and then of course, once, you know, once I got further into uh, college and, and into working in theater professionally, um, theater was one of the safest places for people to be open about their gender identities and their sexuality. Um, though, oh man, so many friends lost to HIV AIDS, including Gordon. Oh, really? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's um, go on. So one of the things um, I have, I'm really horrible at keeping in touch with <laughs> even my friends' writers' careers, because I can hardly keep track of my own. Um, but I was really surprised to see your whole Quest investigation series, which <laughs> is not romance, I think, um, but it's it, really- it, There's romantic subplot. Okay. Romantic subplot, but not a romance, no. So it seems to be mostly kind of paranormal mystery. Would that be fair? Mm -hmm. So yeah, par paranormal cozy-ish mystery is what I call it. Ah. So what kind of drew you to that, you know, away from what you had been writing, you know, several series of, of male male romances? Well, um, I'm a sucker for interconnected worlds, interconnected stories. Mm. And um, maybe it's also part of my, you know, theater background, cameos from, <laughs> from <laughs> other shows. Um, but uh, so I've, I've really enjoyed writing uh, series that are inter interconnected and with characters that sort of branch out. And um, at the end of my the first series that I wrote with Riptide, well, I know not the first one, but one of the early ones. Um, at the end of the series, I had planned for two of the characters to go into business together as an investing as private investigators. Mm -hmm. And so I had always kind of planned that any books I wrote would be about those two guys. Um, and one of them would have to be the narrator. But then I started thinking about it. Well, that their their stories were really pretty much over. They found their their guys, they, you know, they're happy ever after. Um, but there was one character in a subsequent book that some of my readers said really deserved his own story. And so as I look back on that, you know, the, the, the PI organization and this character, they seem to go together really well because he's the only human in that world. Everybody else is supernatural in some way. And he just has to try and figure out what the heck is going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Plus, I was getting really tired of writing sex scenes, so I wanted a break. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's why there, there are four books in this first, what I call it the first cycle, because now people are saying they want to hear more, so maybe. Um, <laughs> so I, I arranged it so that the romance arc between Matt, the, the narrator, and his love interest would span all four books. So at the end of that last book is when they get there they finally get together. Um, ah. So anything I do in the future, I don't know whether it's going to be that same narrator or whether I'm going to shift to somebody else, because there is one character that's a big fan favorite that I know, it, I'm, you know, I owe them his book <laughs> and I've been planning <laughs> it for a long time, but he's still too young in my head. He needs to get a little older before he's ready. Ah. Um, so. Well, I, I think it's really exciting and, and mystery um, has really become a, a really trending genre. Uh, and I know a number of romance writers that have really kind of switched away from romance into mystery. Some of them, I mean, it's really hard not to have any romantic subplots <laughs> if you're started as a romance writer. But I do hear you on the getting tired of writing sex scenes. I was definitely in that <laughs> camp too. Um, and now I'm writing middle grade, so no, oh. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> nice, yes. Um, so the other thing I noticed is that you have uh, audiobooks, mm -hmm. and um, and I, of course, because I have audiobooks, I had to go listen to your narrators, <laughs> and and both of the men um, that I listened to just were marvelous. I mean. 
their intonation, their ability to change tone, to differentiate their characters. And they just had gorgeous voices that, you know, I could fall asleep to if I wanted. <laughs> um, and so I, I just wondered, you know, what was your process for finding them? And, um, and uh, do they work for anyone else, just in case? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, they, um, I think all, th I've worked with three different narrators now. Um, I think all three of them are, you know, are very well known in the genre. One of them, um, the narrator, the narrator Joe Leslie, the narrator, narrator for my Fay Out of Water books, um, recently narrated uh, Winnie the Pooh. So, oh my gosh, and also the Christmas uh, Christmas Carol. So he does other things as well as um, uh, uh, gay romance. But uh, some of the uh, one of the ways I discovered narrators um, is through um, one of the conferences I used to go to on regular before the pandemic kind of shut everything down. Um, gay romance, uh, the gay romance literature retreat, um, GRL, and I met Joel there he, in the fairly early stages of his career. And one of the reasons I wanted him for that particular series was because it's based on Celtic mythology, and they're like crazy different Celtic accents, and and yeah. Joel does those really well. Um, the uh, one of the other characters or characters, narrators I work with is uh, Greg Boudreau, also known as Greg Tremblay. Um, uh, he actually was contracted to do the very first audiobook of mine, which was through Riptide. I didn't um, contact him directly, um, but uh, I got, he's, he's very well known, very popular, very busy. Um, but one of my author friends, mentioned on a, uh, we were involved in a, um, a multi-author uh, series. And she mentioned that Greg had room on his calendar. So I contacted him and um, was very happy that he was able to fit me in. So he's done a lot of uh, uh, that same series uh, books. Um, and the third one I worked with is Kurt Graves, uh, whom I like for, um, uh, who's did my Christmas series, a contemporary. Um, he's, he's got this wonderful um, sort of uh, comforting voice, and but he can also deal with characters. And one of the characters in these books is very extra, which is oh. he's <laughs> extremely excitable. And, and Kurt really captured him well. So I've been very, very lucky to work with these three wonderful men. Um, and I would um, recommend that anybody go out and look for them because they do fabulous work across any number of genres. Wonderful. You never go wrong with any of them. That's great. I, I've only used female narrators so far, but I do have um, a romantic suspense that really needs a male narrator. And I haven't gotten around to contracting it, but um, when I listened to your guys, I thought, okay, <laughs> I, I think one of these guys would really work well, because that's the other part with male narrators is that sometimes they can't do women very well, but mm -hmm. I heard a couple of them do female parts, and I thought, yeah, that really works. I, I was just so <laughs> impressed, and I figured, well, she's an actor. She's been a theater manager. You know, she probably knew these people, like, from 20 years ago and could find them. <laughs> no, no, I, I met them through other connections in you know, my writing genre and in at those conferences. So very fortunate in that. Um, I think I met, I, I never actually met Kurt face-to-face, -face, but he said he was sitting in back of me at, in um, one panel at, uh, at GRL one year. And I thought, hmm, I really like the sound of his voice. So. Ah, very good. So um, let's go on to the next question, which is, um, I find for myself and many authors I talk to that they tend to write some of the same themes in every book. It's kind of like the thing that, that they're either searching for themselves or they're trying to solve for the world or, or whatever. <laughs> and it really doesn't matter the genre, but the themes keep reappearing. So is that true for you? And if so, what are those themes? And if it's not, what makes you so special? <laughs> <laughs> Eats the hell out of me. Um, are we talking themes or tropes? Um, 
I, I think of them as themes. Um, for me, it is, you know, like, like one of the themes that I'm always writing about is coming of age and finding identity because probably because I've come of age about five times in my life now, <laughs> you know, because at each, it seems at each change in your life that you have to kind of rethink all of that again. So that's like one of the things that I write about all the time, but you can talk about either themes or tropes, whichever you would like. Well, I, I find that I do lots of fish out of water things uh -huh. simply because I, I have always felt like an outsider, no matter where I am. So it's like, how do I find a way to fit in? And so that's what a lot of uh, my characters try and do. It's like they're they're put in a situation that's unfamiliar to them, and they have to figure out how to make their way. Um, so there's you know acceptance um, uh, as well as self identification, I guess, self knowledge. Um, I don't know that I can specify any other particular theme other than that. It tends to be fairly broad in terms of the way that it's <laughs> that it's implemented in any kind of in any book. There's always some some aspect of that, I think. Uh, just I don't fit in here. How do I make that work? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I do think that that is a theme and mm -hmm. a lot of people can identify with not feeling like they fit in. You know, even people whose entire life is fitting in, usually they're trying <laughs> so hard because they have that fear. So, <laughs> so I, I can really understand that. Um, one of the things you do, and, and I'd like to kind of understand this better, is writing humor. I mean, that seems to be something really important to you and something that I am really awful at. Uh, <laughs> so I, I wonder, um, is that part of kind of just the way you think or do you purposefully, you know, really try to inject humor and in? because you seem to write, I mean, some really good snark without being mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sort of my, my tagline uh, is uh, romance and mystery reality optional. But the you know the sub the subtitle might be if it's not fun why bother, uh. so even back when we were still actors I much preferred acting in comedies with other people than you know the the angst ridden dramatic monologues or whatever um, because I, I think it's because I internalize. Uh, sadness too much and I don't find crying cathartic so I don't want to do it I don't want to experience it and I don't want to write about it so um, I'm looking I'm always looking for something that will help me you know buoy me up be you know make me lighter and I'm also married to one of the most uh dryly witty men probably in the world so <laughs> oh we we helps. have that sort of conversations <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, even when I was doing back, uh, working in accounting, it was always about the jokes, you know, hmm. two plus two equals five. Yeah, accountants just know how to, how to have fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, so that's it's because, great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's because humor is important to me and because I like it, that's what I um, sort of gravitate towards. And hopefully I do it well. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, I haven't read a lot of your books, but what I have, I do think you do it very well. And I admire that a lot. Um, we are totally opposite in that way. You know, <laughs> I would rather take the um, crying, angsty, oh, my life is the pits part <laughs> in acting. Because <laughs> I, I don't know if I identify with it, but I think I identify with the underlying emotions a lot. And, um, and my books tend to reflect that as well. I always do issue books and people <laughs> who are having really difficult lives, but they do get justice in the end. <laughs> so that's important it does work out. <laughs> um, so what are you planning to write moving forward? You know, you, are you planning more romance or more mystery, more fantasy, all of the above, something maybe completely different? Um. Yes. 
Um, I've just launched um, a tra more traditional cozy mystery series with a, a collaborator, um, C.K. Eastland, and our first uh, traditional cozy mystery came out on Monday, as a matter of fact. Um, it's the first in the Crafty Sleuth series. Uh, it's called Die Cut. Um, and we have uh, seven books planned in the series. And wow. it's been just a total hoot working with C because she essentially, well, um, her, she's also uh, writes as C. Morgan Kennedy. Um, and you probably oh. know her from- Oh, I do, I know that name. Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, so it, it, originally she, I was, we were having brunch together multiple times when she was um, looking for a different job and um, was working on a series that she wasn't sure whether it was a, a mystery or a romance. I said, well, I'll take a look and maybe we can work on it together. And so I, I read a book on writing cozy mysteries and was reading about what the sleuth was like. You know, they, they are very active in, in a, a particular sort of niche community. They have lots of connections. They, you know, all of these, you know, XXX. And I went, basically, that's C. So I said, you are the sleuth. So we, we, she's actually the embodiment of the, of the main character in these books, which is which oh. has just been a hoot to do because she's so much fun to work with. Um, I'm also uh, have another book in my largest uh, world um, coming out next month, which I need to finish. Um, I've got a, a contemporary male male romance uh, coming out, hopefully, once I get that revised. Um, more books in the co in the Crafty Sleuth series, uh, possibly another cycle of quest investigations. <laughs> so I've got a whole list of things on my uh, possible to-do list for 2022, and I just have to buckle down and do some of them once tax season is over. <laughs> yeah. Oh, are you doing taxes as, as a side business or? No, just for myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, after you're in denial for them for so long and you, then you have a week to do them, it, you know, it's down to the wire, I guess. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's usually my approach. <laughs> you know, oh, the 15th is coming up. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what is the best way for people to connect with you if they want to learn more about your books or about you? Well, my website is ejrussell.com. It has a, a list of my books, my audiobooks, also um, links to my uh, social media presence, which I'm kind of an introvert on the internet as well as in real life. So I don't have a really broad footprint on uh, in social media, probably the best place to connect with me is at in my Facebook reader group, which is called Reality Optional. Ah. Um, it's pretty low key because that's the definition of me. <laughs> um, also Instagram, EJ underscore Russell underscore author. But all those links are on the website. The website is probably the best place to start. Okay, and uh, do you have a newsletter for people that you know want to hear from you regularly? I do. And the sign up is right there on the on the website, too. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. And for all my listeners out there, you can learn more about EJ at her website. And I will put all of that information into the show notes. So you can look right there with a link directly to it. And I hope that you do check out her books. So thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time with another episode of Dust Jackets, Conversation with Authors.